Dear, <clears throat> dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, today the church calls all of us to celebrate the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. And at this Mass, I would like to reflect with you on what is the Immaculate Conception and what lesson does it hold out for you and for me today? To, to my left in the hallway that separates the sanctuary from the sacristy is a mosaic reproducing a very famous painting by the Spanish artist Murillo that presents an artist's conception of Mary immaculately conceived. The original artwork goes back centuries, but the faith of the church in understanding that Mary was conceived without original sin goes back much, much earlier in the life of the church. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception developed through many centuries, found expression in the Council of Trent, in the teaching of Pope Alexander VII, as well as in the universal devotion of faithful throughout the whole world. So that in 1854, Pope Pius IX proclaimed in a document entitled Ineffabilis Deus, that, quote, the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. In 1858, when Mary appeared to Bernadette Subiru at Lourdes, she identified herself with that title. I am the Immaculate Conception. And this great basilica, this great national shrine, the national church of our nation bears that same dedication, Mary under the title of her Immaculate Conception. But what does Mary's Immaculate Conception say to, to us today? What lesson, what inspiration do we derive from that unique gift that was given to her alone in anticipation of her being the vessel of the Incarnation? Perhaps one lesson that we learn when we reflect on Mary's unique gift is the realization that there is a world of grace. There is a world of God's grace, of the presence of God's Holy Spirit, that we, because we're a people of faith, we can recognize and we can enter that world of the Spirit. The church, the church holds up Mary's Immaculate Conception to remind us that this world the human condition, all that followed as a result of that first reading we listened to today, all of the experience of our limits, our weakness, our failure, are only one part of the full picture. There's a more glorious understanding of who we are and our destiny. Each of us is created in the image and likeness of God and while we have a human body, we are also graced with a spiritual soul. That's the name we give to that spiritual dimension of our existence, of that enduring reality that is capable of being nourished by God's grace, that's capable of living in God's spirit. The Immaculate Conception is held up for us today by the church to say to you and to me, there is more to life 
than the material world we see around us. There is more to existence than the finite experience of the human condition. Each one of us is called to see the greater reality, a far richer, fuller world, the realm of grace, the world of God's spirit, the kingdom of God's grace at work within us. We enter this realm of spiritual reality. We enter this dimension of grace. We enter this kingdom of God being manifest in our world through, through faith. It's only when we make an act of faith, when we are given the grace of faith, that we begin to see. See through the lens of faith. See through the eyes of faith and experience this kingdom of God present in our world, present in the heart of each one of us. This basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in stone, in mosaic, in stained glass, says to us what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says to us in writing. Only faith can embrace the mysterious ways of God's almighty power. This faith glories in its weakness in order to draw to itself Christ's power. The Catechism goes on to tell us the Virgin Mary is the supreme model of faith, for she believed that nothing will be impossible with God. The Church calls us today on this, the Immaculate Conception, to look at Mary and see in her the model of faith, of what our faith can be. Like us, Mary was a human being who had to be open to hear and accept God's word and to grasp the mysterious ways in which God works. And she did so with such consummate fidelity that she is forever the example of what we mean by faith, what the church holds up for us as true, profound, life-changing faith. In this Advent season, which is the context of the celebration of the Immaculate Conception, we pause then simply to hear all over again God's word, his gentle voice, so that we can know, as Mary did, God is near to us, God is close to us, and we can be close to God. Faith calls us to walk in the way of the Lord. We're to love God and our neighbor. We're to struggle against sin and evil, and at the same time, through our works of goodness and love, we're to make manifest, already in this world, the beginning of God's kingdom of peace, of justice, of truth, of love. While while we cannot equal Mary in the wondrous mysteries in which she participated and in her privileges, we can certainly emulate her faith. Although God's ways are mysterious and we do not always understand the unfolding of God's plan and God's providential order, nonetheless, like Mary, we have to open our hearts and say, if God calls, I listen. If God challenges, I respond. My faith in yours, the faith of all of us in this great basilica, the faith of all who are joining us on EWTN, the faith of all throughout the world today, the faith of believers is challenged to be the faith of Mary. As the Catechism tells us, she's the supreme model of what it means to believe. And so we pray, 
we pray to Mary, confident that she is full of grace and blessed among women, and that her Son and our Savior, Jesus, is the fruit of her womb. But all of us who come to this basilica continue that prayer. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. We make this prayer confident, confident that Mary immaculately conceived in whose house we gather around the table of her son's Eucharist will hear us because we open our hearts in faith, just as she did. We open our hearts to hear God speak to us as he spoke to her. No wonder, with great confidence, we pray to Mary, our mother, and we know she hears our prayers, and she takes our prayers to her son. All we have to do, as she did, was open our hearts in faith, faith strong enough to recognize God with us.